Raw the dice game, how to set up and play. The first thing you'll do is lay out the board and all the pieces. You will set the raw token on the epoch track. The game gets played over three epochs. So when the raw token gets to the end here, that's the end of the first epoch and we do some scoring and then it'll get reset and we'll do that two more times for a total of three epochs. This gets placed based on the number of players. For a four player game, a three player game, or a two player game. So I'll set it there. You randomly determine the start player. They will start the game with 10 points and then the play will proceed clockwise. Every player clockwise to the start player will get an additional victory point. So a third player or a fourth player would be there on the victory point track. Every player will get a, their supply of cubes along with a player aid that shows some of the scoring rules. And then finally, uh, each player will get a marker for the Pharaoh track and a marker for the Nile track. And then you'll lay out the dice in the center of the table. That'll be shared by all players. There's six sides on every die. Uh, this is the sun side. This is what moves the raw track and has some other effects. Uh, this is the Pharaoh die that will affect the Pharaoh track. This is the Nile side that will help you move up the Nile and flood the Nile. This is the civilization dice, and that's this track over here. And the monuments track, which is this grid here that actually doesn't get scored until the end of the game. The Pharaoh track and the Nile track and the Civilization track each get scored at the end of each epoch. Uh, the Monuments track doesn't get scored until the end of the game. The final side on the dice is the Ankh and it acts as a wild card during the game. So that's the setup. So on the active player's turn, they can roll the dice up to three times and then apply the results. The only die face that cannot be re-rolled are the sun tiles. If they get rolled, they need to be set aside and they couldn't be re-rolled. Now, if on the first roll I decide oh, you know, I don't want to re-roll that one again and I re-roll these, let's say I'm on my second roll, and based on those results, you know what, I do want to roll this one again for the final roll, you can do that. So you can roll all dice, three times, except for these. Whenever they're rolled, the sun gets set aside. And then after your third roll, the players will apply all the effects based on the token, how they choose, and then the effects of the sun die. So let's talk about moving up the Pharaoh track. So it takes at least one dice with a Pharaoh icon to move up one spot, and then you can also add on additional dice with Pharaoh or Onks to move up that number on the track. So in this case, I could move up to three on the Pharaoh track. And that is right here. So the Pharaoh track is very straightforward. It's just the number of symbols along with any wild cards and you can move up that number on the track. You can never exceed the maximum and go past that. The Nile track works the same way. So it, as long as you have at least one of these boat dice. You can add on additional boat dice or the wild onk and you can move up the Nile track. So two in this case. And then on a subsequent turn you could make the decision to continue moving up the Nile track or you can actually flood the Nile. It requires three boat symbols to do it. They can be natural or you can use the wild to get there as long as you at least have one natural. If you do get three, you can choose. You would basically take another cube from your supply and say, I'm going to flood the Nile instead of moving up the track. And then at the end of the round, you'll be able to score those points. Next is the civilization. In order to play the civilization or apply the civilization effects, it requires a minimum of three civilization dice. Uh, two or less will not help you do anything. So if 
you got a natural three, or you can use a wild. You can apply the effects if you have at least three, or if you have four or five. It allows you to do different things. So if you have three civilization, you can place one cube on the civilization track. It has to match at least one of the colors of the natural civilization, not the onk. So in this case, I could put one cube on the blue or the green space. You're only allowed to ever have one cube on each of these spaces. If instead I was able to roll, and I, let's say I got four civilization, I can put two cubes on the track. And again, they have to go, the two cubes have to go in either blue, green, or red. So I could put green and blue here. And then if I rolled five civilization, I could put three cubes on the track. Again, they have to at least match the natural colors. Um, cubes in these areas are limited based on the number of players in the game. So in a two-player game, only one cube of any color can be in a civilization spot. Uh, in a three-player game, only two. And in a four-player game, only three. So always one less than the number of players is the maximum number of cubes allowed. And remember, an individual player can ever only have one cube in each spot. The civilization track will score at the end of each epoch. Um, and having cubes there will help you avoid negative points, and having additional cubes there will help you gain points. All right, next is the monument effect. So if one monument is rolled, you can actually place one of your, di uh, one of your cubes on any spot, any open spot on the monument track that matches the color. So in this case, I could place there. If in later rounds I had multiple cubes here, and obviously there's only one cube allowed in each of these spots for all the players, um, or total, in a future round, if I rolled that, I could put a cube there. You'll get points at the end of the game based on having at least three cubes in a column, and also for each cube you have in different columns, and we'll cover that at the end. Now, above one, it'll take two more monuments to put a second cube. So the first one can go anywhere that matches the color. The second one has to go inside a column where you currently have no cubes. So in this situation, it has to at least match that. I can use an onk, but I have to at least put in one of the purples where I have no cubes. So I have no cubes anywhere, so I could put there. The fourth and the fifth follow the same rules. It has to again go in a column where I have no cubes and it has to match one of the natural colors. So if this was the um, sequence at the end of the turn and let's say I had I started the round with those two I'd use this first one to put there possibly my second one I could put anywhere I didn't have a cube and the third one I could put another spot I didn't have a cube. I couldn't put here because I have a cube in this column, but I could go there. You can also, if you decide not to use the onks, the wilds, to help in a, a different action, two onks together uh, can be used to get two points immediately on the scoring track. So at the end of your turn, after your three rolls, and you've applied all your dice based on how you want, you now have to apply the sun tiles. For two or less dice, those kind of act like that, and it causes the raw marker to move forward that amount. So it would move forward to amount, and you don't get any benefit from these. When this obviously gets to the end to there, that's the end of the epoch. If you were to roll three, and the turn ended like that, three or more suns do not move the raw token. Instead, different effects happen. So with three suns, uh, you actually get to score three points immediately on the scoring track. And again, the raw token would not move. For four or more suns, uh, the raw, again, would not move. So the raw token's only gonna move 
with two or less. If you get three, you get three victory points. It does not move. And if you get four or five, uh, again, it does not move, but you get to apply a disaster to all other players. You can choose between four disasters. Uh, the first is the pharaoh disaster. Basically, a pharaoh would, um, a leader from another society would die, and then all other players would move back two spaces on the pharaoh track, but never below zero. If you apply the Nile disaster, all other players would have to remove um, a flood cube from the Nile. So if they had flooded a Nile, it would cause them to take a cube, a stacked cube off, and they would be unflooded. Or, if they haven't flooded yet, they'd have to move two spaces back on the Nile track. If you do a civilization disaster, all other players would have to remove two markers from the civilization area, their choice. If they don't have two and they only have one, they just remove one. Obviously, if they don't have any, um, they wouldn't have to remove any. And then, I'm sorry, the civilization area, they'd have to remove two from this track. And the same applies to the monuments. You could have a monuments error um, disaster where each player would have to remove two. So the civilization and the monuments work the same in terms of the disaster. All other players would have to remove two of their cubes from those tracks, their choice. So when we reach the end of an epoch, uh, play will stop at the end of that turn. Um, you'll need to remember who triggered uh, the end of the epoch, because then play will proceed normally, clockwise, um, after that player. And you're going to score uh, three of the areas. First, you're going to score the Pharaoh track. The player with the highest position on the Pharaoh track will gain five points, but they'll have to move their marker back two. So yellow would gain five points on the score track, but move back. And the player that scored the least would actually lose two points on the score track but they would get to move forward. All players in the middle uh, would have no effect. So again, if you're in the lead, you get five points immediately on the score track, but you have to move back two to start the next round, and the player that was in the lowest position loses two points on the score track, but they get to move forward for the next round. Next, you'd score points for the Nile track, but only if the Nile was flooded. So here the red player was able to flood the Nile, and so they would score three points immediately on the score track. The yellow player was able to advance, but not flood, so they would get no points. And everyone retains their position on the Nile track for the following round. The flood cube gets removed at the end of the epoch, so to score again in the next round, red would have to re-flood, and then yellow would have a chance to also flood for those points. Next is the Civilization track. Uh, all players that have no cubes on the Civilization track actually lose five points immediately. If you have one or two cubes, you get zero, so you just break even. If you have three cubes, you would get five points. Four cubes, you'd get ten points immediately. And if you have a cube in all five of the Civilization colors, you would get 15 points. So just to recap, You'll score Pharaoh track. The leader gets five points. The lowest player loses two points. Anyone who's tied shares on that. So if all players are tied for first, uh, they would all get the five points and suffer the same movement penalty to move back. Uh, Nile, only if you're flooded, you score the points, then remove the cube, and then points based on how many you have on the civilization track. Cubes remain on the monument track, but they will not be scored until the end of the third epoch at the end of the game. After you score the epoch, the raw figure will move back to the start position based on the number of players, and you'll replay another round. At the end of the third epoch, you'll do scoring as normal on the pharaoh track, the Nile track, and the civilization track, but now you also score the monuments track. If for every column, up to six, where a player has a token, they'll get one point. If they have 
a cube in seven different columns, they'll get 10 points. And if they have a cube in all eight columns, they'll get 15 points. In addition, they'll get points for having multiple cubes in a single column. If they have at least three cubes in a single column, they'll get five. If they have four cubes in a single column, they'll get 10 points. And if they have five cubes in a single column, all of them, they'll get 15 points. Add up the score track, and the player with the most points wins the game. And that's everything you need to set up and play Raw the Dice Game.